Greetings, pilgrims. Pastor Ben here, electronically, although not physically present with you. We'll be talking about the subject of the covenant of grace today as we continue to work our way through the subject of covenant theology. So we already have looked at the definition of a covenant, the parts and parties of a covenant. So the parties of the covenant are the Lord of the covenant, the mediator of the covenant who represents the body, and then there's the represented body of the covenant. So those are the parties, the parties involved in the covenant. And then you also have the parts of the covenant, which you can see in your notes. I put the parts of the covenant, the promises, laws, oaths, and signs. These are various parts of covenants. We'll get more into the details of these parts as we go on through the rest of the study. I mostly just want you to understand the big picture of these things, but especially today, as we study the subject of covenant theology and the covenant of grace, it becomes really important that we define this correctly because the way we define Adam and his covenant and Christ and his covenant parallel each other. So I'm going to begin with a quote from Herman Witsius, The Economy of the Covenants Between God and Man, Volume 1, page 169. It's printed on your handout. Quote, in order the more thoroughly to understand the nature of the covenant of grace, two things are above all to be distinctly considered. First, the covenant which intervenes between God the Father and Christ the Mediator. Secondly, that testamentary disposition by which God bestows an immutable covenant, eternal salvation, and everything relative thereto upon the elect. The former agreement is between God and the mediator, the latter between God and the elect. This last presupposes the first and is founded upon it. So you can see there the relationship of the Lord of the covenant with the mediator of the covenant, and then the Lord and the mediator to the represented body are very important relationships to define and understand accurately. If you Consider the parts of the covenant as well, thinking about the laws, the commands, the promises that are made to the mediator. They're, though the same in substance, basically, for us as the body, they come to us differently because they come to us through the mediator. Like I always say, what the mediators do affects you. What this shows us is that there's essentially one kind of covenant, covenants of works, that all covenants are covenants of works for the mediators. And there are two mediators in Scripture. There was the man, Adam, that God created in the Garden of Eden. And then there's the God-man, the second Adam, who fulfilled the covenant of God, the covenant of grace. But it's really a covenant of works. So when we talk about the covenant of grace, we're actually talking about how it comes to us. Commonly so-called is what the Westminster Confession calls it. The covenant of grace commonly so-called. The reason why is because technically the definition of what the covenant is is still the same kind of covenant as originally in the Garden of Eden with Adam, but now it's made with Christ. It only comes to us as grace because Christ has fulfilled the covenant and we have our salvation in him. So I'm following Witsius on this. I really have found no one to have advanced beyond Witsius since he wrote his books, um, his two volumes on the subject the economy of the covenants between God and man. He's so thorough. I recommend it to you. We have it now in PDF form on the app. You can also find it. It's on sale right now on Reformation Heritage Books for, I think it's $30 or something like that. It's usually $60 for both volumes. So I highly recommend it to you. So we talked about the parties and the parts of the covenant of grace. Um, and I just want to point out that we are really talking about now in this context Witsius's twofold relationship, the twofold relationship, the relationship between the Lord and mediator of the covenant and then the Lord and mediator to the people of the covenant. Uh, so the proof that Christ is the mediator, that he is the seed of the woman, and that the seed of the woman refers to the mediator, and that the seed of Abraham also refers to the mediator, and the continuation of the promise of the mediator that was made in the Garden of Eden was then reissued to Abraham, comes to us actually all the way from the New Testament in Galatians 
chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. So this draws it all together. Galatians 3, 19 through 20 reads, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. So he's talking about the law that was given to Moses. Why was it added? Well, from a retrospe retrospective perspective, you know, because Paul's looking after Moses, the Apostle Paul is describing the actual effect the law had. Now, certainly we know from Moses himself that it was the way that they were supposed to live in covenant and relationship with the Lord. But what we find out from the after effect was that it actually created more transgression. It resulted in Israel finding new ways to sin against the Lord. And then, of course, it says it was through the agency of a mediator. And so we know that Moses was the mediator of the Old Testament in a typological sense of pointing forward to Christ. He was a foreshadow, a pattern, a type of Christ. And then it says, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So this is a theme in Paul. He talks about the promises that were made in the Old Testament were actually made to us, but really to Christ and through Christ to us. So the promise was made to the mediator, the seed of the woman. So he's taking the term seed, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Eve, and applying that terminology to our Lord Jesus. And then he points out that now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. And so there's this dual relationship that the mediator represents uh, God to us and us to God. So he's the go-between, the mediator of the covenant of grace to us, but really a covenant of works to him from the Godhead, who is the Lord of the covenant, properly the Father, uh, to whom it is due to be the Lord of the covenant. All right, so uh, let's look at this and think about the promises, the laws, the oaths, and the signs of the covenant of grace that were made to the mediator. So first off, the promises. The promises include the new creation, the kingdom of God, and salvation of an elect people for himself. For this, we're going to look at John chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. As you're turning there, following along, John chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, understand that this is the passage that is usually referred to as the high priestly prayer of our Lord. He describes it as uh, his prayer where he lifts up his eyes and prays for the disciples, prays for his flock, his sheep, does not pray for the world, but specifically here begins with terminology and categories that really only make sense if you understand what he is doing as a mediator. He's not just praying as the great high priest, but also as the prophet and also as the king of the kingdom, the mediator of his people, the elect. So verse 1 says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So he's praying for glory, whereas currently he's humiliated. He's in the state of humiliation. He's going to enter into his state of glory. He's praying for it now. He's essentially praying for his reward as the obedient mediator, something that we do not do. We don't say, now give me my reward. Look what I've done. Look at my good works and see the good things I've done, O oh Lord. Now give me my reward because our reward would always be uh, judgment for our sins. That's our wages. The wages of sin is death. The demerit is against us. But for our Lord, he is praying for his glory. It goes on, verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So the authority here is the all authority in heaven and earth that the Lord Jesus is given by the Heavenly Father. So the incarnate Lord 
The eternal son already had infinite power. He is one of the persons of the eternal Godhead. However, the distinction here is in his incarnation. He's currently humiliated and he's praying for this authority, which he already has, of course, as the mediator, that he's saying, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, uh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So he has this authority and he is earning this authority. After his resurrection, remember he says to the disciples in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Uh, so this is the reward of the kingdom, the rulership of Christ, the authority of Christ. Then verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the mediated body receives the covenant blessings through receiving Christ in a saving knowledge. So we usually call this hearty faith, uh, converting trust, saving faith. Uh, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So it's knowledge of the mediation of Christ, your representative, that is the saving knowledge by which you receive as part of his elect body from out of the mass of fallen humanity. You get his benefits. Then verse 4. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So he is here stating his obedience, pleading his cause, and arguing that the Father in this prayer should reward him because he has obeyed. He says, accomplish the work which you have given me to do. Now, he has not yet died on the cross. Nevertheless, this is an example of usually what's called by Old Testament scholars the prophetic future. So he's speaking in the future tense, or speaking in the past tense of things that are future to come to pass, in order to say how certain it is that these things certainly will come to pass. He speaks about future realities in the past tense. And so he is about to actually accomplish the work, but now he's actually praying in order to teach this to us, but also to pray it effectually so that he would receive his kingdom, his new creation, and his elect people. And then he says, verse 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In the resurrection, and you can look at, for example, the resurrection passage in 1 Corinthians 15. It's also shot through with all of this uh, terminology and theology of the covenant, the mediator, Christ being the firstborn, Christ being the first fruits, Christ being the representative parallel to Adam. Uh, but importantly here, he points out that the Father is going to glorify himself by glorifying the Son. So this is the reward of the mediator. And then verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So this is referring to the elect people out of the mouth, sorry, out of the mass of fallen humanity. So the elect are out of the mass of fallen humanity. That God has chosen a people for himself. He's given them to the Son, that the Son would certainly accomplish redemption for them. So those are the promises to the mediator. In a nutshell, they are the uh, new creation, the kingdom of God, and the elect out of the mass of fallen humanity. These are the big summaries of the gospel that Christ accomplished. Uh, there are a lot of other things that we can put into these because, of course, the cross accomplishes this, the satisfaction. Uh, we'll get there soon, but these are the promises to him. These are the rewards for him. Um, uh, next, let's look at the laws. The laws for the mediator were the incarnation, the law of God, because he's made under the law, and to offer himself on the cross. So these are the laws. The incarnation, the law of God, and then the offering of himself on the cross. So for the incarnation, you can think of Genesis 3.15, where there's the first promise of the seed of the woman, that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head at the same time as receiving the mortal strike of the serpent on his heel. So certainly the clear statement of substitutionary atonement of the seed of the woman, the one who is to come, we already pointed out, is, of course, according to the Apostle Paul, very clearly Christ himself. 
Uh, Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So that's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. The Lord partook of our human nature so that he would be able to redeem us as the mediator. So that is the first law. You can also look at Galatians 4.4. 4. You can look at uh, Galatians 3.15-16. Those are some additional verses on that, but I'm going to stop there for now and move on to the law of God. Uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, he was made under the law. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So you can see both themes there. The incarnation, born of a woman, and the law of God, born under the law. So here we have these two commands to the son that Again, these are big picture categories. They encapsulate everything that he did. He fulfilled all the laws, all the ceremonies, everything for us. He is not only uh, the one who paid our penalty, but he's also the one who infinitely accomplished righteousness on our behalf. Um, and then also you can look at Philippians 2, 8 through 10, which reads, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So verse 8 of Philippians 3 points out his obedience specifically to the point of death on a cross. So it concludes with the words in verse 9, For this reason also God highly exalted him. The reason for his exaltation was his obedience. So unlike us, the Lord Jesus is meritorious. He accomplished his salvation and then also bestows that upon the elect by the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's move on to the, the last one, which is, of course, offering himself on the cross. Uh, there are so many verses to look at, but let's look at the inner sanctuary of Isaiah 53, verse 10. Isaiah 53, verse 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So notice the word if there. If he would render himself as a guilt offering. And then there are the benefits that he gets as the promises that he receives. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. You can go on to the rest of the passage too and see that the death of Christ, the death of the mediator, is the re it results in his promises that he receives. So those are the three things. The incarnation, law of God, and offering himself on the cross. Those are the laws to the mediator. And then the oaths and signs. Hold on real quick. I got to close the door because my kids are playing. didn't see you there. Oaths and signs. Here are the oaths and signs. Um, some oaths from the Father to the Son. For example, Psalm 2 verse 8, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So there's an oath from the Lord. Uh, Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And actually that's one of the most quoted verses in the entire New Testament from the Old Testament, Psalm 110, verse 1, the promise that he would defeat all of his enemies. Uh, Psalm 89, verses 3 through 4, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. So there's the kingdom promise, of course, the oath from the Lord. He swears to give him this covenant promise. So notice the word covenant. And the swearing of the father uh, to his servant David, which is, of course, Christ, because David is already dead long before this psalm was written. And then Hebrews chapter 7, verses 20 through 21, it describes this relationship of the oath of the father to the son. It says, And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he, which is Christ, with an oath 
through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Uh, which, of course, is Psalm 110, verse 4. So he's pointing out this same thing, which is really where we get it from, this book of Hebrews, which describes this theology to us. Now, on this subject, I want to read to you a quote from Herman Witzius with regard to the signs that the Lord Jesus received. He interprets all of the signs from the Old Testament, all of the types and shadows, and the two New Testament sacraments of baptism and the supper as sealing to the mediator the promises, the laws, and the entire covenant. They are summaries of the covenant to him. And then they bestow, by, as means of grace to us, the benefits of the covenant, the benefits of the mediator. But Witsius says this, and it's at the bottom of your handout, back page, bottom of your handout. It says, I therefore conclude that the promises made to Christ as mediator were principally sealed to him by the sacraments. And of course, in the context, he's talking about sacraments of the Old and New Testament. Christ indeed obtained these in virtue of his merits, or to speak with Paul, because he fulfilled the righteousness of the law. Yet in themselves, and as they relate to believers, they are promises of the covenant of grace. By them it was declared that Christ should be highly exalted and become the head of believers and that they should be redeemed by his satisfaction, justified by his merits, and at length made perfectly happy with him so that he might forever exult for joy in them and with them as his glorious inheritance. So you can see there that he is arguing, and you have to look at the larger context of how he argues it, all the evidence that he gives in the economy of the covenants. But basically he points out that the sacraments and signs were promises and commands to Christ about what he was supposed to do and what he would receive. But they also come to us, again, as the representative body, as bestowing on us what Christ has accomplished. So they represented to Christ, they communicated to Christ what he was supposed to do and what he was going to receive as promises of his obedience. But then for us, they come to us as bestowing the promises, certainly and effectively, according to God's plan in the covenant of redemption. Uh, so from there, we're going to look at the subject of the relationship of mediator to the elect. I'm going to change gears here a little bit because I just want to point out, we've been talking about these parts of the covenant with relationship to the party of the covenant. So the parts of the covenant are the promises, the laws, and the oaths and signs that solemnify it. And then the parties of the covenant, the relationship of the Father and the Son, the Father and the Mediator, and then also of us, the Mediator and the Mediated Body. They come to us as promises of God, of the... Uh, communication of God's love to us that we receive uh, as a mediated body. So we receive everything by grace. We receive everything from our mediator. It's certain that the elect will partake of these things. They cannot but partake of these things because they've already been accomplished effectively for them. Uh, so now we turn to the relationship of the mediator and the elect. So for the mediator, the relationship is works. For the elect, the relationship is grace, and this is why we talk about the covenant of grace. Remember that the word covenant, it can be described with just taking one part, and that can stand figuratively for the whole thing. So when we use the term covenant, we're usually talking about this whole big structure of Lord, mediator, mediated body, and you got promises, laws, oaths, and sacraments, and signs, and all these different things. Uh, but when we talk about the relationship of the individual who is a beneficiary of the covenant, a lot of times the scripture uses the term testament. In fact, the word that is used in the Greek New Testament, the word diatheke, uh, refers to a testament. That is, that the beneficiary of a death benefit receives the bequeathal of an inheritance 
And in the context of the covenant, it's received by faith. So we have this part of the covenant that sometimes describes the whole of the covenant. I'm going to come back to this over and over and over again. It's a very important theme in the Westminster Confession, Herman Witzius in his book, as well as uh, it really makes sense of a lot of passages that otherwise just don't make any sense if we don't understand this from Scripture. Hold on, i got to close the door again. My kids are going to make noise here in a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. Consider that a preemptive strike against more craziness to come. All right, relationship of the mediator and the elect. For the mediator, it's works. For us, it is the benefit, the death benefit. Uh, Adam's covenant, for example, killed mankind. We don't have any ability to repel the covenant of works. What has been accomplished by Adam was effective to kill everyone. The work of Christ, by contrast, saves and elect people out of the mass of fallen humanity, but in the same way, as a mediator, he represented a people and accomplished effective salvation for us in the death that he died, the life that he lived, and the resurrection of his body. His benefits become ours. So when it comes to us, the promises are all as beneficiaries. And so Witzius talks about this on page 284 to 285 in his book. If you're reading the book along with this, page 284 to 285, he talks about how to us it is testamentary. Uh, you can go back to that quote I had at the top of the front page of your handout. He says, in order the more thoroughly to understand the nature of the covenant of grace, two things are above all to be distinctly considered. First, the covenant which intervenes between God the Father and Christ the Mediator. Secondly, that testamentary disposition by which God bestows an immutable covenant, eternal salvation, and everything relative thereto upon the elect. The former agreement is between God and the Mediator, the latter between God and the elect. This last presupposes the first and is founded upon it. So he calls it testamentary disposition. That is that the relationship that we have is that we are receiving the benefits only. We receive none of the wrath uh, we, because, of course, it was accomplished by the mediator on our behalf that we would not receive wrath, but rather of the covenant of grace we would receive salvation and life. So even the curse now for the believer, for the elect, even the curse is Christ's work in us. It's his plan for us. Even calamity, even persecutions are part of God's plan for the good, the spiritual good and the everlasting good of the elect and the kingdom of God. And of course, the glory of God himself. So here's the promises. So again, we're going to go through promises, laws, and oaths and signs. So promises, laws, and oaths and signs. First off, promises from the mediator to the elect. First off, redemption. Redemption is the purchase of a people out of slavery and bondage to our original covenant. The consequences of the covenant, sin and death, and of course, the devil. Uh, justification. Christ is justified. If you look at Romans chapter 4, verse 24, it talks about Christ being justified at his resurrection. That is, vindicated at his resurrection. Declared upright and just. And because he was righteous and just, not just without sin, but positively righteous, he was declared and vindicated the righteous and just one. So our justification is actually the imputation. Us receiving the benefit of his righteousness. That's why it's called the righteousness of God. Covenant theology is the basis of the doctrine of justification apart from works by faith alone. Adoption. This is within directly the context of testamental receiving of the bequeathal of an inheritance based on being adopted into the covenant relationship of co-heir with Christ. 
We become heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God. We become sons of God. So why it should not be translated sons and daughters is because it's talking about this benefit of Christ where we are covenantally receiving the benefits of inheritance of the kingdom of God, the new creation, and of course the righteousness and glory of all things that come. So adoption is our right, our standing of being actually in the family of God. Sanctification is the progressive work of God where he makes us more holy in this life. He continues to morally change us. Uh, of course, it functions a little bit differently uh, because it is not all at once. It will be complete when we die. And of course, uh, the resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. So we'll be glorified when we uh our, uh, when we die, our souls will be glorified and then our bodies will rise. So you have sanctification, resurrection, and then glorification. And then you have eternal life, which begins when we are born again. We are renewed in our souls, but eternal life will actually be soul and body in the resurrection. And then access to God. Uh, Hebrews talks a lot about the access to God that we have before the throne of grace. Lily, close the door on your way through. That no, that door. No, that door. That's the loud one. I thought this would go smoother. Access to God, comfort and assurance. This is a covenant blessing. The comfort and assurance that we will certainly be saved, that we are certainly pardoned for our sins, that we are certainly elect, that if you believe, if you have turned to Christ and received his benefits by faith, you are certainly going to everlastingly benefit from those benefits, um, the blessings of the covenant. So essentially, you can sum this all up to say that the promises to us are Christ. Christ is the mediator. He is salvation. What he does as mediator affects us. This is, of course, the theology of the Apostle Paul whenever he talks about being in Christ. You'll see that phrase throughout the Apostle Paul's writings, in Christ. This is because of the covenant theology of the scriptures. That when they talk about being in Christ, the Apostles are commending to us to understand the relationship of standing that we have, a position, an official status of being in union with Christ by the bond of the Holy Spirit. That you become a partaker in the covenant benefits of Christ. So Ephesians 1 verse 3 is an example of this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, remember covenant blessings, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So for the Apostle Paul, he very clearly talks about how everything for the Christian is located in Christ. So he talks about the heavenly places, Christ is seated above, the work of Christ for us, and that we are in Christ. They may not have all been perfectly or completely applied to us yet, but they certainly will. It is inevitable that the reconciliation that has come to pass will be fully applied to everyone who is united to Christ. It is unstoppable. Uh, this clears up a lot of misunderstandings about the gospel. Once you understand covenant theology, it brings election to clarity. It clarifies the doctrine of justification by faith alone apart from works. It shows why we are supposed to have good works in our lives because it's a benefit of the covenant that will inevitably come to pass. God has foreordained these things so that we would walk in them. It explains why adoption and resurrection are all inevitable realities that must come to pass for the elect. The assurance of eternal security, all these things are based in the largest context of the entire scripture, the big picture, is the covenant mediator. Christ himself is the gospel, and our benefits are in him. Um, so that's the promises, the promises to us. Of course, we receive them by faith, uh, repentance, thanksgiving, walking by faith, uh, 
Various benefits are received in different ways throughout the Christian life. What unites them all together is they're always done by faith with thanks. Uh, so of course, uh, pardon for sin is received in this life while we tarry in the body of sin with the old nature still present through faith and repentance. Uh, we live by faith and thanksgiving. We use everything that God gave us in the old creation for his glory still, even though it'll all burn at the end of the age. We use it with thanksgiving, with faith, with knowledge of the scripture. So we have these internal capacities that were given in Christ through the regeneration that we now express. But they're all benefiting from these covenant benefits as Christ has already accomplished for us. Um, you could probably add in here also eternal life. Oh, I did put eternal life. So, that, you know, the uh, eternal life of being born again. Uh, just one verse to give a little proof text about the concept of mediator, the terminology of mediator. It's used a few times in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 reads, For there is one mediator, sorry, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, he emphasizes the manhood of Christ here because that's what he had to take on in order to be our mediator. He had to take on our humanity to accomplish salvation for us. All right, so that's the promises to us. And then the laws. There's the laws. Um, now, of course, the relationship of the laws to the believer is that we receive them from the mediator. The Lord Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So the laws come from the mediator. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth. He told them to go make disciples, baptize, and then teach people to observe. Not just teach people doctrine, but teach people to observe the things that are taught. The doctrines and the ethics of Christ are imposed upon us by the mediator. The same mediatorial structure as any other covenant that we see in the scriptures, that these covenants are always where the mediator imposes and enforces the laws upon the mediated body. Uh, and so the Lord Jesus is king, is ruler. Uh, we owe him our allegiance and our obedience as the king and the ruler of the covenant. He is the mediator, the king. Uh, so this refers to the moral law as well as all ceremonial, in other words, the ordinances, the religious practices that we perform. So everything that has to do with the Christian life, uh, the Old Testament sacraments and signs are all fulfilled in Christ, and so they are no longer enforced. They still uh, preach Christ, testify to Christ from the Old Testament, but they no longer are enforced in practice. The New Testament sacraments, the New Testament ordinances, like the preaching of the word, reading of the word, prayer, and things like, like that, we still practice. Uh, they come from the Lord Jesus from his throne, and we ought to be practicing those things. So not the ceremonial law, but the moral law and the uh, New Testament ordinances we are supposed to practice. Uh, and of course, the moral law, you can see in Old and New Testament and, of course, in an obscured degree in the laws of nature. Uh, but we have other things to talk about with regard to that. That's another subject. All right, oaths and signs. The oaths and signs uh, of the covenant include, uh, so Old Testament. Let's look at Old Testament and then New Testament. So Old Testament oaths and vows. They had different kinds of oaths, different kinds of vows they could take at the tabernacle and then later on at the temple. You have uh, sacrificial types of Christ. There are hundreds of different types of sacrificial uh, signs that point forward to Christ. You have the official two sacraments of the Passover and then of circumcision, and then many other expositions of them throughout the law of Moses, the ceremonial laws specifically. So those are all different kinds of Old Testament oaths and signs uh, of the Lord to his people, which communicated information about Christ to them before it came to pass. The reason for the complex ceremonial system that they had in the Old Testament was so that God would be able to communicate to them in some sort of concrete form so that they would understand the 
concepts, the doctrines of Christ's accomplished salvation on their behalf, even though it had not yet come to pass.